Uh, our second session will be on Fukushima, and um, the session chair is our materials expert, Professor uh, Ron Ballinger. Good morning. Uh, this session uh, is titled Lessons of Fukushima. I would probably think we should rename it to Lessons from Fukushima Rev Zero, uh, because there's going to be multiple revisions. I'd like to read you a, uh, the latest press release from TEPCO. On approximately 5.56 p.m. on March 30th, that would be today, a 2011 TEPCO employee discovered smoke generation from a power panel. Subsequently, the fire department consisted of TEPCO employees inspected, da da da, and uh, fire, fire generation stopped after interrupting electrical supply. That kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. They're trying to energize this plant that's been submerged in seawater or run over by seawater, and so it's just an enormous uh, effort. <clears throat> um, I'll introduce both speakers at the same time, uh, all at once this time. But uh, you should probably also take a look at Professor Cosme has a number of titles, uh, some of which we can't mention. Uh, but one of them, um, he is the TEPCO Professor of Nuclear Engineering. And uh, that connotates, uh, that, uh, tep we have had a long relationship with TEPCO. In fact, many of the department's former students are TEPCO employees. Uh, one of our former students, uh, when I talked to him last, he hadn't been home in two weeks. He'd been getting two hours of sleep per day, sleeping in his office. Uh, another one has been, um, uh, he's at the site. Uh, they need people to uh, deal with the radiation issues. And so it's an enormous, enormous effort. Um, the two speakers that we have today, uh, Lake Barrett, and Jacopo Bongiorno represent two generations of uh, nuclear engineers. Um, Lake Barrett um, was a former uh, head of the Office of Nuclear or Civilian Waste Management, which is probably the reason why he's bald and has a thick skin, <laughs> because that had to be one of the toughest offices to be associated with uh, that I can think of. Um, he was. Um, uh, uh, one of the instrumental folks in the initial um, uh, response with the department, he started sending emails to various people, and he was, uh, it was a very, very thorough job uh, and uh, <clears throat> very authoritative, and uh, his predictions at the time, have, all of them turned out to be correct. So we figured we better get him here before he uh, loses his ability to make predictions. Uh, uh, the second person uh, that will be talking will be Jacopo Bongiorno. He represents the next generation, the young generation that we have here. And um, we're in the department uh, having to learn how to speak Italian because we're hiring two or three Italians. I don't know what the reason for that is, but Jacopo is a brilliant scientist. Um, and uh, the department got together and uh, Jacopo will present the consensus of what we think um, the issues are in going forward. So we have two, two great, great talks. And um, I'd like to uh, hold your questions. We had our, a, a high level organizational meeting last night at Legal Seafood. <laughs> salmon was pretty good. We were cautioned, by the way, that the next time we had salmon, we would probably have to do an analysis for iodine. <laughs> but so we bulked up on salmon last night. Um, uh, to hold your questions until after Jacopo's talk so that we can get both of these guys up here. Uh, the, you'll see that there's a synergism which, uh, which will develop. So without, uh, with that introduction, I don't know where Lake is. There he is. Uh, I'd like to introduce Lake Barrett. Thank you, Ron. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I really feel very humble being before such a knowledgeable audience because uh, I don't deserve to be here. Um, I guess sort of you're never sure what fate in life is going to do. I just happened to be at, involved with the NRC at Three Mile Island um, initially during the accident. Um, today is the 32nd anniversary of Black Friday. Monday was the 32nd anniversary of, of the accident start. Uh, and so I kind of lived through that. I went to the site. I became the site director for the cleanup for four years. So I, I lived through the... The, the, the worst and the best of the Three Mile Island experiences. Um, so when Fukushima happened, uh, with some of my colleagues and friends said, well, what do you think? And I, I was in a position where I had no affiliations with the government, 
nor with any industry. So anything I said, nobody cared. So uh, I could kind of let it all hang out a little bit. So um, what I'd like to do is kind of go through on sort of my personal view of what's going on. Um, I noticed that I did, I did the presentation that's in your folder on Sunday night, because I didn't know I was coming here until last week. Um, and this is a revi revised vision. So in the area of continuous improvement, this is the better one. Um, one of the things that I found in my experience when things all go to, go to pot on you, you gotta go back to fundamentals. If you're a civil engineer, you can't push a rope. You're a mechanical engineer, F equals MA. You're a nuclear engineer, E equals MC squared. All right, when you're faced with a horrendous situation that the folks at Fukushima are, you gotta go back to basics. And the more uncertain the situation is, the further back you gotta go. So my title here is we're going back to 2,500 years ago to the Greek times of what the fundamental elements were, and that's energy, though they called it fire, uh, but I use the word energy today, air, water, and earth, okay? And I think that's where I would like to start with this, and I will try to end with this at the end. So if I can work this machine, we'll go along. Uh, Three Mile Island, um, just a little bit, PWR, uh, it had a normal, trans normal transient, a, a pilot operated relief valve stuck open on top of the pressurizer, the operators thought they were going solid, turned off the HPSI and injection pumps, and they uh, put radioactive uh, uh, water down on the floor as they burst the rupture disc on the uh, relief tank and put a little bit of water in the basement. Uh, the core was uncovered for three, about three or four hours. Uh, it got hotter and hotter. They didn't know this was happening, and we had uh, core melt in the center. This progression, I think, happened at the three reactors at Fukushima, units one, two, and three. Uh, we had a billion dollar cleanup. We did a lot of R&D. Idaho led uh, on that work, and the Japanese contributed to this and had engineers here for the three mile cleanup. Um, there are a million pages of documents in the Idaho archives that they are basically unearthing at this point. And I will mention these were all translated into Japanese, and the Japanese have them. TEPCO will find them eventually uh, over there in, the, in their files. But this is sort of what happened with the core uh, a little over, almost a third to a half melted. Debris was down, down the bottom. I don't know, oh yeah, down the bottom, et cetera. Um, one of the things we had, we had hydrogen come out uh, when the fuel oxidized. We had a hydrogen deflagration in the containment building. It was a deflagration, it was not an explosion. We did not have supersonic shock waves. It's like when you turn your gas grill on and you're late putting the match in, you get a big woof of, of fire. That's what we had at Three Mile Island. Um, but we had a lot of the same things happening there. Now, we had a, a big PWR containment, but we had three meter deep, about 600,000 gallons in the basement. Uh, when we finally got in there 18 months later, it was 1,000 R per hour, and we cleaned all that up. Uh, now, I won't go into this, but basically there's a history. Things we did there, uh, first you deal with the cool the reactor, you cool the core. They got to cool pools as well. Uh, then you want to deal with your airborne effluents and contain that, then your liquid effluents, and then your solids. Uh, in 10 days at Three Mile Island, we had the first water processing systems working uh, at the Epicor 1 system, we called it. And then we brought on a month later Epicor 2. Then we brought on submerged mineralizer system. So there is a precedence on how to start the recovery process. Long and hard. Uh, in the case of TMI, we spent over a decade and spent over a billion dollars in 1980 dollars. This was the water cleanup system for all the highly contaminated water. We put that in the empty spent fuel pool at TMI-2. TMI-2, in many ways, only had 90 full power days on a core. We did not have a full core equilibrium of cesium and strontium. Japanese do. Uh, we got in and started cleaning up the fuel. Um, these are the operators working, you know, picking up fuel pieces and putting it in cans. Now let me move to Fukushima Daiichi a little bit. Um, there's six reactors, oops, let's see. Uh, now I've botched up. Um, I'm not gonna talk much about it, but unit five, six is up here, one, two, three, four, the main things, uh, main reactors that are stressed. The common spent fuel pool is back here, has about 1,700 tons of fuel in that pool. Uh, they've been, sh they ship pools, ship fuel from here to, um, to France and to England for reprocessing, so for as old a plant it is, it doesn't have that big an inventory, uh, but that, at some point, they're gonna probably need to get that fuel out of there and use that pool for a cleanup. There is dry fuel storage. They have nine casts uh, with fuel. That's the least of the problems at that site. Um, these are all, um, I'm not gonna talk about five and six. They're, they're basically in cold shutdown and non-issue. 
Um, but one, two, three, and four are GE Mark I containments. Um, I'll come back to that a little bit long. This is sort of a photo of the Browns Ferry Mark I containment, just to get a sense of what the dry well is. It's known as the upside down light bulb uh, here, uh, basically inch thick steel. Uh, and this is the dry well head. Uh, this may have been the source of some of the hydrogen coming in that blew up the buildings, but we don't know, at least I don't know. Somebody may know. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. But I just want to give you a sense of what it is, and you can see it as a little man sitting up there on top, just to get a sense of how big it is. Now, this is concrete. We'll go all around the lower section of this. Um, they had the earthquake. The uh, design basis, is my understanding, for the tsunami was 5.7 uh, uh, meters. Um, most people have said it probably would have functioned OK up to 10 meters, um, but they had a 14-meter tsunami. Uh, and it flooded the switch gear was, and motors, and so many things were just inundated with salt water. And we'll come back to that because I think that's their current biggest challenge they're dealing with at the moment. <clears throat> um, uh, fuel tanks were swept away, et cetera. Uh, but in all right, just a little bit, for the, when, for the first hour, they had, they had an hour between the earthquake and the plant seemed to do OK during the earthquake as far as taking the seismic loads. It was slightly over design basis as far as the dynamic loads on the, on the units, and they seemed to be OK. But when the tsunami came an hour later, and it was good they had an hour's worth of cooling, uh, took out all the power. Therefore, the only thing they had left was the non-AC power cooling systems. For unit one, they have an isolation condenser. Uh, in units two and three, they have the RICSI, or the um, reactor core isolation cooling system, which is turbine-driven, uh, whoops, turbine-driven. OK, here, uh, it's steam from the in, to, injects water back in. Uh, it needs batteries to, to run the control valves and governors, um, is my understanding. But anyway, after about eight hours, the, the batteries ran out, or they had problems with the Unit 2 Rixi, uh, and they did not get water into the Unit 1 isolation condenser. I do not know why. All they needed was a fire hose up there, but it didn't happen. Um, this is something I'm sure in the months to come we'll find out what went on. But when they weren't getting water to the core, the water level in the core started going down. The core started to overheat. Uh, heat was being rejected either through manual, manual, vent, manual dumping to the primary containment, or they were lifting uh, primary relief valves. Um, the core started to overheat. Uh, and um, they reached a point where the containment became saturated. Uh, and the containment pressure went up, started to over, potentially overpressurize. And either they manually vented, which should go up the stack. Uh, and they were, I'll get into the inside the core in a minute. It's a little bit out of water. But um, you had hydrogen that they were, were releasing. Now, just a little bit more in the containment. Here is the, one of the problems in this is information flow. At Three Mile Island, information flowed two days late. You would think that would be kind of crazy, but that was in the, Fog of an accident, sort of like the fog of war. It takes a long time when operators at Three Mile Island, as I'm sure here, operators in the control room had air masks on. Now, for those of you who've, who've worked with you know, protective clothing and air masks, it's not easy to communicate and talk on the phone with, with respirators on. Uh, that happened at Three Mile Island. So on Black Friday, which was 32 years ago today, we were just learning that they had a core degradation and, and hydrogen, that it was that bad, all for the first day and a half. This was a big cobalt 60 crud burst, which didn't make sense. But you can go back and you can read the Rogovin report and the Kennedy Commission, et cetera, as we went through that. But the same thing's going on here in Japan for the information flow. But we have to add one more thing to it, a cultural difference between Japanese style and American style. You cannot judge another culture through the lenses of your own glasses, of your culture. So when we look at what the Japanese are doing, okay, you can't look at it solely American way. You have to look at it from their culture. And this is basically an American GE plant, 40 years, 30 years ago, translating the Japanese, and now you're getting translations back. And you, I find lots of confusion uh, in the press, for sure, between a reactor vessel, which is, we all know is, is, is here, the reactor vessel, the primary containment, and the secondary containment. So I caution everyone, be careful with what you read, because more than half the time, it isn't correct. And, and a lot of them are not that somebody's being dishonest or trying to hide. It's just miscommunications in, in the fog of an accident. Um, 
what happens is that hydrogen went into the, either venting or they lifted the um, uh, upper dome of the primary containment. Hydrogen went into the building, and unit one exploded of uh, uh, hydrogen. Now, what I believe was going on inside, first, the core was not being covered, and the core starts to heat up. The cladding burst, releasing the noble gases, krypton and xenon mostly, and the hydrogen, the helium overloads, helium overpressure in the fuel. Uh, the, clad, the cladding oxidized, releasing uh, hydrogen, uh, the, the zirconium uh, water superheated steam you know, reaction is highly exothermic. You had a lot of hydrogen, which doesn't condense. Uh, they, I'm sh I would predict that they had quite a bit of melting going on inside. They had eutectics forming between the zircaloy and the stainless steel of the shrouds and all the um, non-uranium metal components inside. You had a primary coolant system overpressure, probably lifted the relief valves and blew down into the torus. Uh, then they had no cooling for the primary containment, so the primary containment is overpressurizing. Um, so they reached the point where the primary coolant excuse me, the primary containment pressure reached probably pushing 100 PSIG. Um, and that was filled with sort of a witch's brew of, of hydrogen and steam and fission, ga and fission gases, uh, as well as you'd have some entrained iodine uh, and, and cesium, strontium, all the, all the ugly things. Um, either this, uh, the weak point of the Mark I containment, everything has a failure point. Most likely here, based on some tests that were done down at Brunswick, uh, which is a Mark I uh, containment when it was under construction, totally non-nuclear test, the pressure raised in, and you had some elastic yield on the bolts on the upper head of the primary containment uh, and may have pushed the O-ring out and gas escaped that way, or there may have been venting as I showed earlier. Exactly how they vented and where they vented at Fukushima, I don't know. I will say for American Mark I containments, we have, through the severe accident analysis work done by the industry and the NRC, the vents are hardened. So if they reach the situation in the American plant, uh, they should have been able to vent the primary containments through the filters up the stack, which would have prevented the buildings from blowing up. But I don't know what they had at Fukushima. They may have had, I've, told, I've been told they had some hardened vents, but it's too early to know. Um, well, anyway, they got hydrogen out into the building, and that's what caused the building to blow up. Probably got toward 10%, because you could see, actually, in some of the videos, you could actually see the shock wave going through, going, going outward. Um, and basically, they blew apart the secondary containment in buildings one, one and three. Okay, here's building one before and after. This is just a steel frame building on the top. Normally, this is under a negative pressure with the standby gas treatment system putting a negative pressure on it, putting any effluents out through the filters, charcoal filters and HEPA filters. They had no AC power. They had no fans. Um, then uh, Unit 3 kind of followed shortly after Unit 1, and it blew up as well. Uh, we'll come back to that. So what we had here is the um, you know, vapor venting uh, outside. OK, with a, well, let me right now we're cooling the core. They made a decision. They started injecting seawater into units one, two, and three, which were the operating units. Uh, they put over a million gallons already so far of seawater. They're now pumping in fresh water uh, because there are concerns about salt caking on the, on the rubbleized core. The rubbleized core is very heterogeneous. Uh, I'm sure it has hot spots in it, and it probably has salt uh, layers around it. That is, it's just very unpredictable as to what's in there. But the good news is, I believe, that we're past the worst of the thermal, uh, and it is basically steady state thermal. But the cooling mechanism is through feed and bleed. And what that means is they have got to vent, and they're venting today. Until they can get into a, research, a better mode of cooling, they are venting. And what this is doing is exacerbating their problems with airborne releases and liquid releases. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, now I'll go through a couple, some photos. This was when, right after Unit 3 exploded, the good news was the wind was blowing out to sea. This was a tremendous good luck situation for the, for the Japanese. Um, now, this is after Unit one, 1 and 3 had blown up. You can't really see it very well, but I'll say this is Unit 4. 
Now, unit four is OK at this point. Um, and I was going to sit and write a little email message that the worst is over, et cetera, on Wednesday morning. And I pulled up the next pictures, and I saw unit four top was apart. So now I'm going to shift away from the reactor core, which are job one, to what became another job one, the spent fuel pools. The unit, the BWR, just to orientate a little bit, uh, in a Mark I containment, the storage pool is up here. OK, this is your uh, refueling cavity here. They take off the missile shields. You take off the, the, uh, the head, the drywall head, and then you flood this with gates. And you put a, you put a water uh, inflatable boot here along so you can flood this and move fuel. I don't know what happened at Fukushima, but the thermal analyses is this pool, they had I offloaded the full core in, out of the reactor. It was a 100-day-old core uh, uh, from the, when they shut down. Uh, they were, it's my understanding, they were putting new shrouds on, which is a standard, uh, standard um, you know, maintenance procedure that they were doing. Um, and then they had the earthquake. Uh, they should have been OK in this pool for at least seven days. But on the fourth day, um, it overheated. At least I believe it overheated and uh, oxidized itself. Um, don't know why they lost all that water. They could have had the gates may have been closed, and they may have had the the, uh, the refueling cavity drained and the water, a lot of water drained out of the pool. Uh, they could have had the gates open and they could have lost these seals. Just don't know. But for some reason, they overheated this pool and that's up above. Uh, anyway, when I looked at this Wednesday morning, this is what the building looked like. Now, the only report you'd gotten out of here was that had a fire in Unit 4 and it was a lube oil, for, it was lube oil from a pump and the fire was out. But something didn't sound right because that night they evacuated the they evacuated the workers, so there was a whole lot more going on that we didn't that we didn't know. Um, now, this I'm having trouble just seeing what I'm looking at. Oh, this is just sort of, I'm going to I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. This is unit five and six over here, which we're not talking about. I'm going to focus in on the units one, two, three, and four. This is sort of a close up. Now. I'm not an academic at all. I'm really sort of a trench engineer kind of person. But you could teach a whole course on this picture. Now, this isn't the best picture to look at from here. But let me orientate you a little bit. This is unit one with the top blown off. This is unit two, unit three, unit four. This is unit two. One, I would say, heroic thing that the TEPCO people did was they learned when this one blew up and that one blew up, I expected this to blow up shortly thereafter. Okay. But what the operators did is they went into that building and took the, one of the panels out. Okay? And what that did is it allowed the hydrogen to diffuse out of that building and keep it from blowing up, which was a good thing. Now, this was good guys. Knowing that these buildings blew up and this could blow up shortly thereafter, I give them a lot of credit for what they did. Now, uh, what's happening, as I mentioned before, they're feeding and bleeding the, the core. And also, the pool doesn't have that much fuel in it, I don't believe. But this little plume of, of vapor coming out of here is the vapor basically coming up out of the torus, up through. And that's how that core and, and pool is being cooled. Um, this is unit three. Notice this big white plume right here. That is probably the pool boiling in unit, in unit three. Now come to where unit three is today. And then this is unit four over here, which I believe had probably multiple explosions. Of, and the only way I know you get that kind of energy is overheated the core, oh, excuse me, overheated the fuel that was in the pool. There's no fuel in the core in Unit 4. Uh, and had the hydrogen release, and the hydrogen ignited. Um, and that's what blew that building apart. And that steam and vapor you see there is probably, probably the Unit 4. Uh, this is the turbine buildings, which the ocean is to the front of us. And these are the diesels that are in the basement of the turbine buildings. Um, this is a photo of the Unit 4 pool. This is probably the refueling bridge crane, the big 100-ton crane. I uh, don't know where it is. I've heard reports in Unit 3 that the 100-ton big bridge crane is in this Unit 3 pool. I don't know if that's correct or not, but uh, you'll find all kinds of speculation. But you can see it is one heck of a mess. Uh, this is just another picture of, of the of the physical destruction of the explosions of the building. Uh, you can actually see some of the, well, not on that one. There's fuel tank pictures. Here's another perspective. This is unit three. Notice how the, the, the structure, superstructure has collapsed. This is 
they talk about various fires. I don't know what that all is. It may be some localized burning of material that's ignited. It may be, I uh, just don't know. But uh, some of that is steam also from the Unit 4 pool, excuse me, Unit 3 pool, and here's Unit 4. They can see some of the panels are actually blown in. This was probably from the explosion of Unit 3, when, which impacted that. Uh, you'll see holes in roofs and things like that where debris went up in the sky, it came down. So this place was full of missiles uh, when, those, when, those buildings, when those buildings went. Uh, this is another closer up picture of the boiling, what I believe is the boiling of the Unit 3 pool. And the, and the TEPCO folks, uh, you know, quick, you know, quickly, um, I wished it was quicker, and I'm sure they do too. Uh, but in the heat of battle, it's nice. You can always Monday morning quarterback folks. But they got high-pressure uh, fire equipment in to actually spray water up. They sprayed a million gallons each up onto the Unit 3 and Unit 4, unit four pool. Now, this is highly contaminated with cesium, strontium, cerium from, the, from all the pool fires and the core venting. Um, uh, so you just, all this water is washing on down into floor drains, storm drains, whatever. Um, now they've gotten a little more sophisticated with time. This is a, a, uh, one of the cement injection uh, equipment you see it in a high-rise building where you pump concrete up high, but they're long booms, 300-foot booms. So they actually have got that down into where the pool area is so they can inject water down into the pool area. Um, now what they... The cooling, I believe still today, is feed and bleed, uh, which keeps you getting into uh, environmental releases. They need to get into a closed system. They need to get the RHR systems working, uh, which to run the RHR systems, you need to run service water pumps or bring in new pumps to get the heat exchangers so you can recirculate and cool and prevent the bleeding, uh, the, the bleeding of, the, of the radioactively contaminated steam. Um, this is easier said than done because much of the switch gear, um, maybe the pump motors, have all been flooded with seawater. Uh, and seawater and electrical equipment usually are not very compatible. So, I mean, these motors are big. I mean, they're the size of a car. They weigh tons. You've got to get rigging. Uh, you've got people wearing uh, suits, et cetera, and respirators. Working is a hard, hard business. These are some photos that I pulled down of what it's like. At first, the guys had to bring in the the power lines, which was no small feat, they did that. And here you are seeing them working, getting the, getting the, the lines close to bring them into the units. Um, but then inside, I mean, they now have electricity and lighting in the control rooms. But this is not easy business, uh, figuring here's guys working on a panel, trying to energize these big panels. So it's easy to say, why don't you have these things running by now on week three? When you're in the trench doing this, it's not so easy. So I don't know how long it's going to take them. Uh, to do it, but I will say they're working minorly hard to, to achieve um, you know, closed cooling. Um, now kind of back to the four basic elements uh, a little bit on where, the, where they are and where I think they're going to be going. First, you got to get the, oops, the, energy, the energy, and you got to open feed and bleed is better than nothing. So they got that, that's good. And I think we're on the downside of the thermal control, but they need to get the closed system going to stop the venting to mitigate the release. Then you got to focus on the gas release. Um, same, same logic we had at TMI. You got to get containment. You got to get big contamination control tents. We used to call them con -con bags back in Navy nuclear days. You've got to go and basically contain these releases. And you got to get some air filters running, the temporary air filters. Uh, you need to be doing spraying now to try to keep the cesium in the water. Cesium is highly soluble, which is the main thing you, I'd worry about there. Um, so I'm. Maybe they're trying to spray and, and suppress that, those releases. But you got to work on your gas, because that's what goes out and out into your environment. And that's what you, they need to be focused on. Liquid comes next. Um, sometimes the liquid becomes, you get political help. I've noticed that NINSA says, you must. I'm ordering you to stop the liquid releases. This is just what the operators need. I think you need to give the operators a little bit of slack to do the best thing, because maybe that's not the most important. But they got to get liquid release control. Uh, we had this problem at Three Mile Island, as I mentioned. They've got it in quad <laughs> order of magnitude, more challenge. Uh, but they did like dump every tank that had pre-accident water in it and use that to, to store uh, temporarily the highly contaminated water that is all flooded in the basement. I would suspect there's probably 10 million gallons of extremely contaminated water 
in those, in those uh, pipe chases. Lower sections of the, of the reactor buildings are probably completely flooded. Uh, but you got to get containments in, uh, tanks. You got to maybe barge and fill it up with water and take it offshore for now and then, then process it later. Uh, filtration systems, we have lots of uh, water processing capability in the world. You, you know, things you want to learn like at Three Mile Island in the early days, we took standard organic resins that are normally used in nuclear industry. But we had such high cesium and radiation loadings on it, the, the, we had hydrogen evolution from the organic resins. So we learned that quickly and we shifted to zeolites and other materials. So these are just technical, tactical um, issues that you have to deal with in your overall strategy. Then you're going to need to work the solids, contamination control. You've got to contain the material. You've got to package the material. You've got to store it somewhere. Someday you're going to transport it. And you've got to have a disposition policy, right? Just like spent fuel in the United States, we have a little political problem. Well, these folks have got challenges too. They store basically their little of a waste on their sites. This is going to challenge that. So I think one of the challenges the Japanese faced is a, is a policy regime of what are we going to do with, with low level or intermediate level, somewhat transuranic um, uh, solid waste. Um, now, that was looking at the plant from the inside. When the people are looking from the outside, it's a different set. You know, what you see depends on where you stand. So from the outside, uh, these are what I consider the basic three main phases that, that everybody has to face with. First, there's the, you know, dealing with the plan itself. Uh, there's impossible information demands, and you just have to kind of live with that. That's going to happen no matter what you do. Uh, but this kind of goes on hours, days, and weeks as they basically establish better and better control. But the thermal period uh, is critical, and we're here. Now, maybe this is going to be months. I hope not, but don't know. Uh, the environmental impact period, as the people outside start seeing actual numbers from outside. Um, it's easy to be critical from afar. I noticed some of the early Japanese reporting, TEPCO reporting says it is X thousand times normal. To say X thousand times normal for plutonium is the public perception kiss of death because it's already so low because we haven't been test doing airborne testing, the weapons testing. Um, the numbers are huge. You should be relative to a maximum permissible concentration, say 10 CFR part 20 for the United States or, or whatever, but uh, your reference points are very critical as far as what the public perception is going to be. But you're going to see cesium, uh, iodine is going to decay away, but, and this is scary stuff, and there's going to be real impacts, and there's going to be remediation. The on-site the on conditions are very challenging, but they're going to have off-site cesium. It's going to be very, in, very intermittent, uh, is they're going to want to bring people back home. People want to go home. Uh, and this is not the Soviet Union. I won't go into Chernobyl unless you want to in questions later. Um, and then you have the societal institutional reaction periods, which goes, starts on day one. Day one of this accident, Congressman Markey put a letter out about how bad this was and what we needed to do with Pilgrim. So you're going to, the political thing starts on day one, but it's going to go on for decades, as Professor Lester mentioned in front, as to what our choices are going to be. But I mean, here we have cross-culture, because this is in Japanese space. Uh, of course, political and policy and financial. And TEPCO has asked for a $25 billion loan. You know, normally, in Japan, that deal is cut on the golf course. Okay? This is not going to be so easy this time. So um, exactly what's going to happen as far as how the Japanese government gets involved and all that, it's going to be very complicated. Uh, to go forward. And, and what the repercussions are going to be here, as Professor Le Lester mentioned earlier. I'll give you a couple of some personal perceptions that I have, having lived through some of these, nothing of this magnitude, but a little bit of the way the policy things went. Because if it's a microcurie or megacurie, the public doesn't know. That's radiation and it's bad. Uh, but first, this is not a public health catastrophe. I mean, it's just inconsequential compared to what happened with the earthquake and the tsunami. Um, I, I'm very disappointed in what our government did with the evacuation decision. I don't think the NRC um, or, or Chairman Yasko, whoever made the decision, uh, I know Mr. Pakalak is here, I don't want to put him on the spot or anything, but what this 50-mile thing that we did <laughs> was, was very sad to me. We'll come back to that if you wish to later. Um, but this is an industrial plant catastrophe. I mean, $10 billion worth of electricity generation just went, became burnt toast and it didn't come back. Even TEPCO admitted, I think, yesterday that it's not coming. Those four plants aren't coming back. Units five and six can run. 
I mean, they got to fix it up and do some things. They, got, they punched holes in the roof to make sure any of the hydrogen coming from the natural radioactive decomposition didn't cause an explosion there. But five and six can run. And the Japanese need electricity. I mean, they got rolling blackouts. And, and that has a huge, huge public impacts to have blackouts on people who are recovering from this terrible catastrophe um, kind of thing. But um, they've got three, oops, three severely damaged reactor cores and two severely damaged pools and a lot of other things. Um, uh, this is going to be a long cleanup, an expensive cleanup. Uh, this is 10 plus billion dollars easy, and it's going to take decades. I believe it's technically achievable. We did TMI. It was a much easier thing to deal. TMI was a walk in the park compared to what these folks are dealing with technologically. But the Japanese are strong people. They've got technology, and the world is going to, I think, help them. Um, and uh, you know, they can certainly, certainly do it. Um, the energy dissipation is, is better, but still not over yet. Uh, the salt cake issues, and uh, um, they need to get that closed cooling established. Um, the environmental release is the growing challenge. You're going to read more and more about it in the paper. Uh, wait till the first cesium-137 shows up in the, in the Alaska salmon, which is only a matter of time. But I mean, you're going to find it right back on the headlines. Um, uh, the institutional communication has been mentioned before. I mean, you open up the paper, you see radiation, radiation catastrophe, and then you're going to see all the dead bodies in the body bags. You see it on the top front page of the Washington Post. And you know, so everybody, reader, thinks, oh, these are all dead people from the nuclear accident. We know that's not true. But that's not what a lot of people in the, in the world don't think. Um, lessons learned, Jacobo's going to talk about it. Thank goodness we got young, cap capable people like he and, and others that are coming along to clean up what the old guys like me have messed up. But um, basically, from TMI, we had a wake-up call at TMI. Now, there the lesson was operators and running the machine and that. Uh, and we learned our lessons, the industry did. Um, and and US, U.S. nuclear safety vastly improved, and its productivity went up. Uh, and uh, so that was, uh, we learned from that, and it became a very positive thing. Uh, the most painful lessons are usually the most teachable lessons that we have. So, the greater that I look back in your life, probably the strongest lessons you had were the ones that hurt you the most. Uh, and I think this is a real painful lesson, but I think we can learn from it. Now, hopefully, these lessons will strengthen nuclear energy as we go forward, as TMI did, but we really don't know yet. So the, the, those chapters are not written. Certainly, the um, accident scenario, what I've described here, we'll soon learn much more than what I've said, because a lot of this was speculation where I would read between the lines. You know, Japanese never shoot from the hip. They just culturally don't do it. Americans do it all the time. Uh, Americans make statements, and they don't care if we hurt the face of the people above you or below you. Japanese, you careful what you say. You don't want to hurt the people above or below. Um, so, I mean, you, you, all of this has to play through, okay, in, in, as we go forward. Now I'm going to turn it over to Yakubo, who's going to talk a bit about what they're going to do to fix the things that we did. And then we'll take questions as best we can. Okay, move on to the next slide, please. Um, can you move on? Oh, I have control over here. Okay, good. So um, since both Lake and uh, Ron in the same session, I figured I had to do something politically incorrect myself um, to just you know, fit in with the tone of the session. So I decided to put a bunch of ugly photos of me there on the first slide but because I want to give you a, uh, my own historical perspective on the accident. So when the Three Mile Island accident um, happened in 1979, I was, I was eight, and uh, I think it's safe to assume that I would have trouble spelling neutrone, which is the Italian word for neutron. Um, then seven years later, uh, the Chernobyl accident came along, and uh, at that time I was 15, and most likely busy playing soccer and chasing girls to pay any attention um, to nuclear accidents. But the, this latest accident is really uh, between the eyes, I would say. And, uh, you know, how we will respond and overcome the, challenge, the challenges, the many challenges posed by this accident, uh, in many ways will define um, my generation and the younger generation present in, uh, in this room today as, as nuclear engineers. I, I personally believe, and I'm sure many here share, the same thought that uh, uh, nuclear energy is too important to let a, uh, uh, an accident, however severe as Fukushima is, stand in the way of uh, its uh, potential contributions to the many challenges that humanity faces in energy and environmental. But it's really our responsibility, the responsibility of our generation to, uh, uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, that uh, nuclear energy remains and underlying remains 
a viable and attractive uh, option for the future. So with that introduction, uh, let me say the first step in this direction is to uh, try to understand what lessons can be learned from this accident. And uh, uh, that's basically the subject of my, of my uh, presentation here, or my talk. And to be more specific, uh, we, we have tried to identify what are the major safety-related issues that have been highlighted by the accident and identify possible solutions in the design, regulation, and operation domains to address those issues. There are a couple of important caveats here. The first has been made already a couple of times today, and that is uh, the accident is still evolving, and there are many technical aspects uh, and, uh, of, of really what happened uh, throughout the sequence uh, that are unknown for us to be uh, you know, certain about certain uh, about conclusions and things of that sort. So keep that in mind. Not the infer so some of the ideas that are presented here basically have not been uh, fully assessed for their technical uh, accuracy and feasibility because frankly the information is not available. And also some of the ideas uh, to address the issues posed by the accident here have certainly not been vetted for their economic feasibility. And so with that, you know, with, with that in mind, uh, please realize these, what I'm going to present are not recommendations, but are rather I would say possibilities to be explored, are ideas that we're putting on the table uh, to inform the public debate and, and for us to discuss, uh, to discuss collectively. By the way, these ideas came from uh, uh, the NSC faculty, the Nuclear Science and Engineering faculty, in a couple of brainstorming sessions that we've had over the past three weeks, and boy, had, there been, had they been uh, um, intense, intense week. Uh, all right, here there is the first, I don't know why, the first uh, uh, a bullet there is, uh, is missing. But basically, we have organized our thoughts into six areas. The first bullet missing here is emergency power, how to maintain emergency power in uh, beyond design basis external events. The second is emergency response to such events. The third is containment. The fourth is hydrogen management and spent fuel pools and plant siding and site layout. So I have slides about, uh, about all of this. Oh, there it is. Good. So emergency power following beyond design basis external events, which really means massive earthquakes, tsunamis, floodings, things that uh, you have anticipated, but their magnitude you have not designed against. Okay? So the observation, as Lake explained, is that um, the, the uh, station blackout ultimately led to fuel damage. The station blackout came from the loss of AC offsite power, and that was caused by the, by the earthquake. It basically knocked out the electric grid. The loss of on-site AC power, and that was caused by the uh, tsunami wave, which took out the diesel generators. And ultimately, the batteries ran out of energy. So they, they, you know, they came to a complete discharge, and that also uh, took out the uh, DC power at the, uh, at the station. So really, the plant was left in a state of complete, uh, of com of complete, of complete blackout, and that led to fuel damage. So the key question is, how do we prevent or defeat this, this scenario? And some ideas here are obvious. Others may be less obvious. The first is, well, you could house the diesels, which provide your on-site AC uh, power uh, in, and, and, and their related equipment, including the fuel tanks, in rooms above grade or in waterproof rooms so that they would not be overwhelmed by, uh, by a wave, uh, by a tsunami wave or flooding or things of that sort. Another one that is a little bit less uh, conventional, we, we, we saw that basically, it took, well, in fact, it, it has been taking over two two and a half weeks to actually restore AC power at the, uh, at, at, at the plant. and so. An idea that came up in our discussions is uh, perhaps uh, either the NRC or FEMA or even consortia of utilities could maintain small fleets, a small fleet of transportable diesel generators or even gas turbine generators. These are essentially jet engines that could be brought to the plant very rapidly either by air, road, or water, whatever is necessary to basically restore AC power and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and get, the, uh, and get the, safety systems, the safety systems going. And finally, uh, a mix of passive and active safety systems may actually become a requirement, with the emphasis here, of course, being on the passive safety systems, which by definition do not require AC power to, to function. And again, this is obviously not a, a, a new idea, but the, the, the thought here is should we make it a requirement to defeat the, the station blackout? I'm sure the station blackout will, will rise uh, in, in everybody's mind as, uh, as, as an important scenario following uh, Fukushima. Um, the, the, the second area is emergency response. How do we respond to beyond design basis external events? And the first observation from the Fukushima accident is that it's very likely, although uh, we haven't seen any numbers out there, that TEPCO actually lost key staff due to the earthquake tsunami, that people actually you know, perished or, or, or became unavailable due to the uh, direct damage done by the earthquake and the, and the tsunami. So the key question is, how, do, how can utilities ensure proper staffing of the plant if the local staff is, de is decimated by the initiating external external event. 
And here, too, some, some ideas uh, you could think of. Uh, again, consortium of utilities with similar plant designs establish perhaps a rapid response team of essential workers that could be transported to a stricken plant, okay? And uh, again, uh, this does not have to be a, uh, you know, a separate group of people that uh, does this for a living, but it could be, for example, people that are on call all the time from other utilities and can be brought into a particular plant that really need the extra, uh, the extra staffing. <clears throat> um, a second observation regarding emergency response, and this has been already mentioned by, uh, by Lake, is there were statements by the, um, uh, by the US NRC uh, about the need, regarding the need for a much larger evacuation zone. And, and frankly, this did not seem consistent with the magnitude of the, of the radioactivity uh, releases at that time, and certainly undermined the credibility of the Japanese uh, regulator, and also created a lot of anxiety and, and stress in the media and in the, and in the general public. So the key question is, we think is, you know, how big should an, an evacuation be, and should its size, should its extension be determined solely by the magnitude of the radioactivity release? And so, again, here, we'd like to uh, explore the idea that evacuation zones should be actually a function not only of the radioactivity release, but also of the direct damage that the initiating event has caused in the, uh, uh, you know, in the local area. Again, be a, a, a earthquake or a tsunami or any other massive external event. The idea here is that the traditional approach that says that, well, the larger the evacuation zone, the more conservative is your approach may not necessarily be correct because what's conservative from a, from a, from a, a, a perspective of, uh, perspective of uh, protecting the public from the radioactivity release may not be conservative in terms of uh, moving people out of an area when they're dealing and coping with, uh, you know, with the direct damage by the earthquake and things of that sort. It could basically, to put in another word, it could, it could cause undue uh, stress and create more problems than it actually solves, given the magnitude of, uh, of, uh, of the radioactivity release. <clears throat> So in, in summary, we feel that the evacuation strategy should be based on minimizing uh, risk to the public from all causes, not just from the plant, particularly when you have, well, particularly when you have an external event that has causes already so much, uh, so much damage to the, to the surrounding areas. Um, the third area is hydrogen management, and uh, Lake already spoke to this. Basically, we had uh, a massive generation of hydrogen from the uh, oxidation reaction between uh, zirconium and, and steam, <clears throat> and then hydrogen ultimately led to the explosions and destructions of reactor buildings at units one and three and possibly four. So how do we reduce the amount of hydrogen generation and also importantly uh, prevent it from accumulating uh, you know, above the, uh, the, the critical concentration that leads to explosions? So an obvious idea would be, well, since the, uh, the source of hydrogen is, is a reactive metal such as zirconium or zircaloys, replace zircaloy with uh, less reactive metals. And uh, you know, I'm sure the, the older folks here remember that uh, in uh, the early days of the nuclear, of the nuclear uh, enterprise, basically the cladding was uh, stainless steel. It was not zircaloy. So ironically, we may have to go back, at least in the near term, to that or that, that it's certainly a possibility to explore. But uh, you know, maybe in the longer term, we could switch to a ceramic material such as silicon carbide uh, that does not generate uh, hydrogen uh, upon, upon reaction with, uh, with, with steam. Uh, another, another possibility is put hydrogen recombiners in the reactor building. As was just explained in the previous presentation that uh, basically what happened was an accumulation of hydrogen within the reactor buildings. And because the ventilation system was off, there was no AC power, that hydrogen could not be vented. Well, you could either vent it or you can actually recombine it in the, in the reactor building. Another interesting possibility is to use louvers in the reactor building that fail open on power loss. So uh, the way, that, the, way the, the operators or TEPCO try to cope with the consequences of, uh, of uh, hydrogen seeping into the reactor building at units three and two was to basically uh, take out a few panels in the reactor building and let the hydrogen out. At the unit three, uh, I think they, uh, you know, they did not that in time, and so it blew up. At unit two, as Lake explained, were, they were successful. Well, the idea is to have louvers, which open. They, they can be fail, uh, you know, they, they're fail safe open uh, upon loss of power, and that would basically uh, create a natural path for the hydrogen that accumulates in the reactor building out of the building and prevent the explosions. And this is a little bit more radical. If you really have to massively vent the hydrogen out of the containment, uh, we could also think of flaring it, okay? And, and again, as I remember, my, the caveat, the technical feasibility of some of these ideas has not been, <laughs> it's not been fully valid. So how exactly you do it, I don't know, but th that's an idea that was floated. Um, the fifth error was containment. The observation is 
Due to the station blackout, the operators had to vent versus cool the containment to prevent overpressurization. Again, remember, the reason why they're venting the containment is they, they're trying to protect the containment. They don't want it to pop, okay? Now, that's because the pressure is going up. A way to keep the pressure down would be to cool the containment. Since now they don't have a containment cooling uh, system available because the AC power is not there, they have to vent it, all right? So the question here is, how do you eliminate the need for containment venting? or mitigate its consequences if the AC power is not, is not available. So again here, use passive containment cooling, not a, not a new idea, and uh, the, new, uh, the new systems such as AP1000 and ESPWR already have this. You do not need AC power to take the energy out of the containment. Actually for both AP1000 and ESPWR, also the ECCS, which is how you get water in and then energy from the core to the containment are, 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 uh, is passive. Um, or you could use uh, the concept of filter vented containment, which has been adopted, I think, in Europe by France and, and Sweden. And here the idea is if you really must vent the containment, do it early, do it right up front, and do it through massive, very high efficient uh, uh, filters. Okay? So again, it's a different approach than what we've taken uh, uh, in the US and also what they've taken in Japan. In Japan, after a while, they said, well, in order to protect the containment, I'm going to have to. I'm gonna have to uh, um, uh, to, to, to venti, but it was not in the, in the book of rules because it's, it's, it's beyond design basis. Okay, the uh, sixth area is the spent fuel pools debacle. And uh, the first observation is that deficient cooling likely caused radioactivity release from spent fuel pools at both units three and unit four, units three and four. The second observation is that the pools, as was shown in a schematic earlier today, are uh, located basically on the, um, on the reactor building floor above the reactor. And so when the hydrogen explosions uh, occurred within the reactor building that, well, the, the spent fuel pools were right there, okay? And so it's, uh, it's very plausible that they were damaged. And in fact, if you do the, uh, the decay heat calculation, the pools should have not basically become uncovered. The fuel in the pool should have not become uncovered for about a week. But already a couple of days after the accident, two or three days after the accident, there was evidence that, uh, that, that, the pool, that, the, that the fuel in the pool was overheating, which tells you that there must have been some kind of leak in the, in the, in, in the spent fuel pools. And what could have been that? What, what was the cause of the leak? Well, we don't know, of course, but it's plausible to assume that these big hydrogen explosions that we saw sending missiles and shockwaves all over the place might have damaged the pools, okay? So uh, the third observation is that when, when all is said and done, uh, it's, it's, it's possible that the bulk of radioactivity release at Fukushima plant may actually come from the spent pool, uh, from the spent fuel pool fires. I think this mostly, the accuracy of this statement will depend on how quickly they'll, they'll manage to uh, eliminate venting from the containment, because right now a lot of stuff is coming out when they vent the containment. But if they manage to stop that quickly, I think uh, most of the radioactivity probably uh, will, will come ultimately from the spent fuel pool fires. So the key questions here are how, how do we ensure reliable cooling in case of a station blackout? And second, how do we reduce the source term for the pool? In other words, how do we take pool, uh, you know, the f uh, radioactivity out of the pool uh, before an accident can occur and then that radioactivity is really easy in the environment? So some ideas here, again, the obvious passive cooling of the pools, this is done in AP1000, not under normal operating conditions, but in AP1000 you have a possibility of using the uh, passive containment cooling water storage tank to basically keep the fuel in the spent fuel pools underwater for, for long periods of time. So that's, an, that's a possibility that, that could be explored also for other plants, in fact, even retrofit uh, existing plants with some kind of passive cooling for the pools. Uh, move the spent fuel to dry storage quicker. Right now, uh, there are several barriers to that. Perhaps the most important is that the fuel, in order to go into dry cask, has to uh, be relatively cool. In other words, the decay heat level cannot be too high. So, that, uh, so this, this idea to, to be implemented uh, would uh, require redesign of the dry casks to enhance basically the, the air cooling um, of the dry casks. And so you're talking, uh, you know, the usual uh, bag of tricks for enhancing heat transfer, things like fins or like a top hat to increase the natural circulations and things of that sort. But that, that probably should be, should be looking to so that spent fuel can be moved out of the pools as soon as possible. Uh, review the policy on full uh, uh, core unloading. Uh, the, the safest place for the fuel to be is obviously in the core where you have lots of uh, safety systems that can provide cooling. And so is it wise to, uh, you know, to have basically a full core outside the pool? We don't know. Uh, how's the pools in containment-like structure? So could we make these, uh, you know, these, these fuel pools not just there on the reactor building level and effectively exposed, uh, but, uh, but in more hardened, hardened uh, structures? And finally, and this has already been mentioned, something that seems to be 
uh, completely beyond our, uh, you know, our uh, domain of uh, decisions is uh, can we create national or regional spent fuel storage facilities and a permanent repository that would be, uh, that would certainly contribute to them, to the solution, to, to, the, to the solution to the problem. Okay, the final, um, the final area is plant siting and site layout. And the first observation is that what it took here was a single external event. It was basically the earthquake and tsunami, but really the tsunami is what did most of the damage. Disable all diesel generators simultaneously. So there was clearly a common cause failure there. Observation two, uh, observation two excuse me. Problems at one unit spread to adjacent units. And for example, the, expo the hydrogen explosions at unit uh, at unit, uh, one, uh, unit three, excuse me, took out a couple of fire pumps that were being used for the uh, um, uh, for injection of seawater at unit uh, at unit two, and also the fires at the spent fuel pools in unit four uh, forced the evacuation of the workers a couple of times. Workers that were working on on maintaining uh, you know seawater injection in units three and unit two. So there was clearly a lot of uh, uh, bad synergies there. Um, because of the uh, physical proximity of the units. So here the key question is first, how do you prevent common cause failure and unit to unit contagion? And um, the, uh, the, uh, the ideas here that we discussed were shown over here. Well, the first and most obvious is, is about siting. And so if we don't build on faults and coasts, you're not gonna have massive earthquakes and tsunamis, okay? Uh, big deal, we already know. So this is an idea from the future. It's noted, however, that, uh, that uh, people tend to congregate on uh, uh, you know, river valleys and coasts and things of the sort. So in fact, siding, away, uh, siding these plants away from those, from those regions actually is sort of a, a, uh, you know, two, two, two birds with a stone because you get away from, from uh, uh, thickly settled areas and at the same time you get away from, uh, from seismic areas and also from, from possible, from possible uh, tsunamis. Again, uh, this doesn't apply to current plants, obviously, but maybe in the future there should be a, a rethinking of where we put these plants. And since we're moving away from river valleys and coasts, most likely this uh, will also um, bring up the issue of how do we cool these plants. And so uh, perhaps there, there will be a push for dry cooling, just using air, basically. And, um, that adds to cost, but what you, what you, what you invest in, uh, in, you know, in bigger cooling towers and things of that sort, you may save in, in uh, a less, uh, less strict uh, seismic and, and flooding uh, requirements. And another idea is limit the number of units to ensure the staff and resources are available to address severe accident impacting all units simultaneously. Again, big challenge here. Uh, you get basically four units simultaneously having accidents and uh, does TEPCO have enough staff there or not? Uh, also on the plant siting and site layout, other, other uh, things to discuss. Enhance layout diversity and separation at multi-site units. For example, you could have a diesel generator room with its, uh, with its fuel tank and its switch gear. One above grade, that will give you, you know, the protection for the tsunami. One below grade, that will give you the protection against earthquake and plane crash. Put administrative buildings and parking lots in between two units. And of course, uh, you know, why are units put together? You know, there is an economic reason. Now you want to put them apart. So you have to pay a little bit of a price. But it was very interesting to see the, uh, uh, you know, the, the aerial picture of the, um, of the plant. And you got four units that are close to each other, and all four affected. And the other two were clearly out there. And of course, they did not have any, uh, you know, any fuel in the core. They were shut down. But so was unit four. Unit four was affected. Unit five, units five and six were not, because there was a lot of physical separation. And so the explosions in, in units one and three did not spill over to the, uh, to the other two. So there is something to be said about also the, uh, you know, the, the layout diversity. Now let me close, because I'm sure we're running out of time here, with a few closing, a few thoughts and, and questions. First, I, I mean, as nuclear engineers, of course, we love to uh, explore possible uh, technical solutions, and some of the ideas here I brought here are pretty wild, and I'm sure they will serve for great, uh, you know, PhD theses, and, and we'll all have fun uh, talking about how to put the cooling, passive cooling safety systems on pools and things of that sort. But really, one has to step back a little bit and ask ourselves, does an accident such as Fukushima, which was so far beyond design basis, because it has been said, the earthquake was beyond design basis, the tsunami was beyond design basis. Uh, the earthquake caused so much direct damage that basically it was impossible to bring in things fast to help, to help people. Does an accident that is so far beyond design basis really warrant a major overhaul of the current nuclear safety regulations and practices? I mean, clearly there has to be a response to this accident, but do we really need to question all the fundamentals of, of, uh, of, uh, of nuclear safety? I, mean, I think it's a question worth, worth asking. And if so, where do we draw the line? When is safe, safe enough? I mean, this is a question that obviously recurs over and over again. 
By the way, it will be interesting to compare the design basis selections, uh, you know, design basis uh, assumptions made um, for uh, of nuclear plants to those of other energy, uh, other energy industry structures posing high environmental hazards, like oil drilling platforms, offshore um, water dams, and things of that sort. The design, the design basis selections, and also the process, because obviously we cannot say oh, nuclear is, uh, you know, is uh, is uh, safe. It doesn't make any sense. Is it safer? Or is it comparably safe to other energy sources? It's always sort of a, a trade-off between between risk and benefits. And so this will be sort of an interesting exercise to compare design basis. Um, just said nuclear energy risk with risk of other energy sources. That's the that's the real comparison. If we want to make our case with the public and decision makers, including the effects on climate change, global economy, and geopolitics. And so here the the, the big question is: Can we really get this idea of risk inform? Of, of, of risk calculation and, and risk information into the energy policy. Right now, it seems to be well on its way into the uh, uh, you know, safety regulation and operation of nuclear power, but can we actually risk inform the energy policy process? So the decision makers really say, okay, if I choose nuclear, the overall risk to society is this one versus if I choose solar, the overall risk to society is this one and so on. So as you see, more questions than answers, but uh, uh, we're just at the beginning here and uh, uh, you know, we welcome any, uh, uh, any suggestions and comments. <clears throat> Finnis. Yeah, yeah. Sure. We like Finnis. I guess I'll do. Uh, this is Finnis Southward from Arriva. Uh, relative to the siting question and, and, and the Akaba, I just offer this for your, your consideration. Um, units one through four are pretty much surrounded on all three sides by, by high bluffs. Um, and units five and six, which with a bluff in between uh, four, the other four and five and six, there's flat ground to the north. And if you look at uh, Onagawa and Daini, similar geography where there's flat ground to the, to the north and south of the units. And it appears to me that, that given the stream magnitude of the, of the tsunami, specifically those four units, that there was a bowl effect there that greatly magnified the tsunami that wasn't in evidence at the other uh, 10 units that were affected. So do you have any thought on that? Or, I mean, is that something that probably could have been thought about or should think about in terms of tsunami uh, physics, if you will? Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm by no means a tsunami physicist, so I can, <laughs> I can, really, not, uh, I can really not comment on that. But uh, it will be interesting to go back and see why the different uh, power plants that were exposed to similar waves uh, behave differently. And uh, Fukushima Daini, which is a little bit further, I think, north to the, co uh, to, to the coast, apparently did not have nearly as much damage as, uh, uh, south, excuse me, south of the coast, did not have nearly as much damage as, uh, as, uh, as Fukushima, uh, Fukushima Daiichi. And yet, it's, I think it's reasonable to assume that probably the waves were, uh, if not the same, uh, uh, comparable. I, I, I really don't have an answer at this point, but we'll definitely have to look into that as well. But ultimately, let me just uh, reinforce the concept, uh, which was made very clearly by, by Regis earlier today. You cannot design against everything. I mean, you, you have to draw the line at one point. So this issue of uh, risk, not just the risk of the power plant itself, but risk of nuclear energy compared to other uh, energy sources has to come into, into play, because the response cannot be of, of the response to the accident cannot be that, okay, we're going to design against a tsunami of 20 meters everywhere, or that we're going to design against an earthquake of uh, magnitude uh, 10, if it even exists. Uh, you can tell I'm not an earthquake uh, physicist either. But, uh, so I, I, think, I think that that concept has, has to be brought up uh, very, very strongly. Sort of an engineering question. Uh, in general, do plant currently the decay heat is fairly low. The pressure is is low, so we don't need a gigantic pump. We don't need gigantic heat removal capabilities at this point. Are we talking about cutting pipes to put in like emergency motors and heat exchangers and things like that, or are we talking about yeah. valving in? Based on your experience with the. Uh, you know, with nuclear units that you've been associated with? The answer is I don't know the situation here. I mean, I think the RHR system is fairly big, physically big. The motors, the service water pumps are physically big. 
at this stage, they don't need a huge one. So maybe bringing in a, a, a small heat, relatively small heat exchanger they can bring in and setting up a whole new system and, and you know, taking off a bonnet of one of the big valves and pipe it in that way. I don't know. It would seem to me that's the kind of thing they should be trying to do. But then again, I'm 10,000 miles away. I can't second guess these guys. Um, so just don't know. But it would seem at this stage, two weeks in, no, you don't need the great big RHR system. But it's not easy doing this. And one thing you find, these plants are made, <clears throat> you know, with security and rigidity, and you got big, thick walls. Things don't move very easily. You're working in protective gear. You got to get rigging up. Um, it's hard to get access in because it's so protected. So sometimes you find your security precautions are detrimental to rapid response for emergency for emergency situations and beyond design basis. So there's a balance to all of these. So it's very hard to know. But yes, a small heat exchanger at this stage would probably work. Okay, so I think what you're telling me is the plants weren't, didn't accommodate beyond design basis to, to uh, you know, by having some, some valving that you could uh, open up and connect some other sources of water, et cetera. Well, they had some. I mean, for example, they got the fire injection, the fire trucks, right, diesel fire trucks to pump water in fairly quickly. So they had apparently some okay. pre-designed rapid injection situations as, as some American plants do too. So there was some beyond design basis planning. Was it what they wished it was? The answer is no. But that's always after the fact. And I want to mention one thing about the, you know, the worst case thing. I got ambushed by, but they do it all the time on some press thing. You know, what's the worst possible thing? What's the worst outcome that come out of this? You know, they're looking for the sensational headline. I said, well, the worst thing I would say as an engineer is a big comet comes out of the sky and hits it, okay? <laughs> and it goes up in the air and it'll be the end of the humankind, just like it was the end of the dinosaur, and you're really not worried about the nuclear particle. And that kind of ended that discussion. <laughs> okay? uh, but I mean, they're looking for the headlines. I mean, the, the news media is like entertainment tonight. You know, and the bigger and sexier the doggone thing can be, you know, the more they love it. You know, so uh, this worst case and beyond design basis gets to be a real quagmire for a technical person to get into it. We're also a meteorite shield. Or uh, I mean, this gets into the balance your last point on risk. I mean, you have to balance risk or else we won't have any energy and we'll go back and live in a cave. So, yep, at the risk of beating the drums too early, may I suggest that you're talking about extreme environments like a earthquake 10 or a tsunami 40 meters. Modeling and simulation could be a way to think about that. Okay, because it's cheap. You can do it on the computer. I think we talked about Castle and we'll hear more about the capabilities of Castle. Castle tries to look realistically at performance, but also think about optimization of our existing systems. So if you have a computer model, let's say it's not perfect, but it's reasonably reliable, you can start to ask questions, what if? I mean, it doesn't mean you have to do it, but at least you have more database for the decision making. So who's driving the bus today, guys? Right. He's right here, so I'll give it to him if that's all right with you. Yes, well, I will be brief. Mike Podolsky again. We are talking about uh, the current state of affairs that there's less decay heat power, so things get better. A few days ago, I, I received an update from Japan uh, talking about the measurements, so the temperature outside the vessel, reactor vessel, was almost 300 degrees C. The pressure inside the vessel was around three atmospheres, which means that the temperature inside were much higher, and the collability of the, the molten corium is questionable. So uh, here, I think understanding what's going on requires a more comprehensive approach, and I would agree with what Sid said, that we should make an organized effort to really understand, not to predict, but at least to understand and look into long-term consequences, because it's not clear that everything will uh, go away in a smooth manner. I'll come in. All data is suspect. I mean, I don't know. I saw those readings. The next day, they were not that way. So just don't know. You have to, you want to believe your instrumentation, but under these circumstances, you 
a lot of caution on single data points to just look weird. I mean, we went through this at Three Mile Island and Superheat and all of that, but I mean, we just don't know yet, and we have to be patient. And patience is hard when people want to know what's going on there, why didn't they do this, what's this? And patience is hard to come by. So on, on that topic, I think one of the items you might add to your list, it's because it's Rev Zero, right? Is I remember at the end of TMI, post-accident sampling systems, right, became the rage. And it could be that we need to improve those because without the right knowledge of what's going on, I, there's conflicting numbers. How can you have 300 degrees C and no pressure? I mean, if there is saturation in there, unless I'm forgetting, well, I did pass the qualifier, so I guess I got it right. <laughs> That's a one true thing, story. Let me, let me think what I mentioned about post Three Mile Island. I was on the Lessons Learned Task Force right after Three Mile Island, and we made a lot of things, and that was one of the big ones. All right? But later we got a little smarter about it, and we sort of risk informed lessons learned, let me say. And a lot of the, it was more, the initial reaction of Three Mile Island Lessons Learned was more deterministic. It was, okay, what were the problems? Boom, 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 and he came up with a laundry list and checklist. And some of those things the industry was spending and it was not a cost-beneficial use of resources to minimize the risk. And, and, it, and it got distorted. And I think the NRC learned from that in that early 1980s and revamped it to become more risk-informed, which I think was a great advance. So I would caution the world as we say, okay, we're going to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and fix it. You know, be careful. Just slow it down a little bit. I know there's so much pressure on the NRC and the industry. I want the answer like next week. And, and it's going to take a little time, but don't lose the risk-informed, common sense, looking at this, not just the machine and the science, but the machine-man interface, which is crucial, I think, to success here. Yeah, uh, I think that established and closed cooling is obviously the thing that we really want to see happen as quickly as possible. But I think that the, that does rely on the integrity of certain systems that I don't think we know much about. And I'd be curious as to what we think we know about the suppression pool integrity, the status of reactor vessel integrity, and the, ins the status of fuel pool integrity. Because without those, then this closed cooling capability becomes very difficult to implement. On the, um, on, on the integrity of the vessel, I think it's, uh, it's, it's safe to assume that uh, there is a lot of molten material within the vessel. And this being a BWR, it has penetrations for the control rods at the bottom of the vessel. I think it's plausible that some of the material maybe has, uh, has basically come through the, uh, the, uh, uh, those penetrations. Hard to tell, hard to confer, but it's, it's likely that some has come out. In terms of the uh, uh, integrity of the... Um, of the, of the containment vessel, uh, the fact that the pressure readings have been more or less consistent above atmospheric for a few days, I think indicates that it's unlikely that there is a hole. Isn't that only true for, for, for unit one? In unit two and unit three, and do we have evidence three. that they are intentionally venting or are they staying at atmospheric? Right. No, no they're, look, right now they're, they're intentionally venting them. From all three. They're intentionally venting them to, to actually prevent the pressure from, 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 going, up, from going up too much. Okay. So that, to me, seems to indicate with, with relative certainty that, the, uh, that there is not a hole in the containment. Yeah. Um, and as far as the pools are concerned, I know people, <clears throat> obviously, the, there has been very hot steam and stuff like that and in, in serious degradation in Unit 4's pool. But I think there are alternatives to to uh, that it lost its integrity and the water has gone away. I know the Japanese have strongly denied that. It have, have others been also looking at alternatives in which in a saturated pool you could starve uh, steam flow, starve flow into uh, some fuel channels? Yeah, Lake, uh, Lake actually last night mentioned something about this. I'm going to let him answer because I think he's got, he's got an idea of what's going on there. Well, don't, just, don't, just don't really know um, what you've got. I think back to the cores. I don't know what the water level is in that dry well, but I would suspect there's a million gallons. I was going to try it before. I thought the question might come up, how big the volume is. I mean, the water may be so high. I mean, the Taurus is a surely flood. 
all the way up into the dry well, maybe up all the way to the height of the vessels, uh, probably covering the vessel somewhat. So if they get into recirc, they will recirc the water in the primary containment, which will cool the core. So if they blow down, if they're blowing down into the primary containment, if you cool in the primary containment, you're basically okay. Pools are, are a real challenge. Uh, we just don't know what their water integrity is, but if they're getting water into it, um, you know, they can get some localized, this would be a portable heat exchanger or something like that on it, and just keep that thing flooded. And you get a, you get, then you get a containment over it of uh, blankets or, you know, sort of a, a mylar type cover or something that you can get a filtration fan and recirculate and cut out, uh, you know, what we have going forward with that. I've got a student back here I was asked to get, if you don't mind. Okay. Yep. Hello, Matthew Denman, a uh, recent graduate of the department. I uh, have a question more on the communications lessons learned aspect. There's been some uh, really good uh, insights from the nuclear community on TV. There's also been industry executives who've gone on with three by five cheat cards that have uh, had trouble answering questions. MIT's own nuclear image has been usurped by a political science professor here to a, a certain extent. What are the lessons learned going forward for the nuclear community about how you communicate in this age of new media? <laughs> I'll start and pass it off. I mean, it is really, really hard. I mean, we had the exact same thing at Three Mile Island, but then you didn't have the internet and the rapid communication and the access to different people's views. I mean, I would, as a lessons learned, I think the nuclear community ought to pre-designate things, the university ought to say, okay, this is what, this would be the MIT view of this, okay? But then again, in a free society, anybody can say almost what they want to say, and a lot of the press to get their ratings up, well, let's take the most emotional, exciting one we can do. I have to give a lot of credit to some of my colleagues that, that don't necessarily see it like I do. As I say, Ed Lyman, a union concerned scientist, Dave Lockbaum, you know, union concerned. they've been pretty responsible in what they've said on the TV. Um, so, you know, it's hard to, to control information in this thing. It's going to get harder in the future as we have such diverse, diverse communication. It's probably something in a free society we have to accept that there's going to be bad information flowing around that's probably better in the long run. But the community ought to get better to say, where are the spokesmen? I mean, NEI and others, it's really hard. No corporate, I mean, uh, if you're a big corporation and you go say something and it gets worse in the morning, it's a bad reflection on them. Uh, and the government has had to clamp down. I mean, you can't have a government, U.S. government official saying ABC and causing, you know, unless you really are like, say, Chairman Yasko or something. Um, but so it's, it's really hard to control it, but I don't think it is controllable. Yeah. Maybe let, let, let me just add one thing. I, I think there are a few things that we could do better uh, that are relatively straightforward. For example, communicating to the public the, uh, the, the radiation doses. Uh, most of the information I've seen out there was basically accurate with some exceptions. But of course, the public, when you say to them that you have uh, you know, 200 microsievert or one sievert, it doesn't mean anything. So, is there a better way to communicate that? And I think there is. You, we, you could normalize everything to the, uh, to the natural background, for example, and say, you know, right now, if you're sitting at a gate uh, out of Fukushima, you're getting twice as much uh, radiation that, uh, you know, per day or per year or whatever it is uh, that you want to express it, uh, that, that uh, you would get under, under uh, you know, natural background conditions. And so so there, are, there are a few things that I think we, we should, we should uh, uh, you know, set up a little bit better for the next, uh, for the next crisis, God forbid, it's happening anytime soon. But, uh, you know, to communicate uh, on radiation doses, that would, that would be an obvious area, in my opinion. I've got a gentleman in the back who's been waiting for quite some time. I don't know if he's a student or not. He looks pretty young. I can't really tell. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Barrett, you mentioned something about the cultural issues in Japan and how would that cultural issue pan out? Uh, what are the lessons in this case for c different countries with nuclear power plants in the West and the East? Are there any comments you can make? Boy, that, that's a good question and it's just a challenge. First, it's a global industry and an accident anywhere is an accident everywhere. We've heard that statement and it's true. When I see a man in America saying, well, the Japanese aren't being forthcoming. They didn't talk about this and talk about that. 
Um, the Japanese culture is very disciplined, very stoic, uh, face is important, things that in America we don't have. So there needs to be some, in, there needs to be in the communities, the international community, how do we portray things in another country? If it was in the Soviet or if this was in China or wherever, uh, how does the other international community respond to it through IEA? So some understanding in a way to help with um, translations and jargon. Jargon is even tough in English, never mind going from English, English to Japanese and then back to English again. Uh, so some pre-thought of, of how to handle that. Um, and tolerance and patience. patience. Uh, patience is just so hard to come by, but you have to say we just don't we just don't know yet. We have to be patient about that and let it work out. And the last thing is, it, in a situation like this, nobody knows some of the conditions, like in the pool. I mean, the operators in the plant don't know necessarily. And so a guy's in a mask, an auxiliary operator goes and looks, comes back, reports to the shift supervisor. Shift supervisor calls the plant manager. Plant manager calls a TEPCO. Uh, engineer in, in Tokyo, he briefs the TEPCO, TEPCO high-level manager who briefs the junior minister who then briefs the government minister who goes on TV and gets asked a question. I mean, you know that's a formula for disaster, okay, because the press has already got some email that says, well, it just blew up two minutes ago or something like that, and, and the guy sandbagged and loses credibility. So it's very, very hard to, to deal with that, but it's just you have to say sometimes we don't know yet. Now, I think the Japanese, my view, uh, have been very cautious in what they say. And, and this leads to people surmising what they said. You know, because if they say it's very serious, wow, that's really, really, really serious. Uh, you know, as opposed to America, you tend to be a little more open kind of thing. So, but it, understanding and work together in the international community would be a good way to do that. Then I'll take one last thing that I'd like to say, and that is if you, I think the Japanese people are going to teach us a lesson in the U.S. that is a very valuable one. Because think about it, there's, they killed, well, there's 19,000 people dead or missing. And the people that are working that plant, they have to go to work, try to fix this plant, and then go home to what? A tent. Right? They're the same people. So I think we're going to learn from the Japanese people uh, a very, very good lesson. I think we have a break.